Well, God is the God of fresh starts and new beginnings and second chances. And if you're in need of a fresh start or a new beginning, then you're in the right place as we look at Glory Days, a series of messages based on the book and the life of Joshua. God gave both Joshua and the children of Israel a second shot at the promised land. All of us need a second shot every now and then. And if you're in need of one, then the story of Joshua is for you. Before we begin, we're going to make our Glory Days declaration like we do every time we open the Bible to the book of Joshua. So please sit up straight, fill your lungs with air, put your head back, fill your heart with hope and say the words like you mean them. You ready? These days are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. God's promises are true. And his word is sure. With God as my helper, I will be all he wants me to be, do all he wants me to do, and receive all he wants me to receive. These days are glory days. May they be so, Lord. May we be aware of the long list of blessings. Grant that we would lift our eyes away from the problems and concerns of life and set them more on you, the source of life. Please forgive the sins of our speaker. You know how many they are. And grant that we can just see Christ. Through Christ we pray. And all God's people said, you'll never have a problem-free life. Ever. Ever. You'll never drift off to sleep on the wings of a thought that says, my today came and went and there was no problem anywhere in the world. The headline will never appear on the front of a newspaper that says, we have only good news to report. You might be elected president of Russia. You might discover the way to email pizza and become a billionaire. You might be called out of the stands to pinch hit the final out of the World Series, hit a home run, and have your face appear on the cover of Sports Illustrated. All of that might happen. Pigs might fly. A kangaroo might swim. Men might surrender the remote control. (laughs) Women might quit buying purses. It's not likely. It is possible, but a problem-free, no-hassle, blue-skied existence of smooth sailing, don't hold your breath. Problems happen. They happen to rich people, to sexy people, educated people, sophisticated people. They happen to retired people, to single people, to spiritual people, to secular people. All people have problems, but... Not all people see their problems in the same way. Some people are overcome by problems. Others overcome them. Some people are left bitter. Some people are left better. Some people face their challenges with fear. Others face their challenges with faith. Caleb did this. Caleb. His story stands out because his faith did. And you find the story of Caleb in the book of Joshua. And we're looking at the book of Joshua because the book of Joshua documents seven of the most successful years in the history of ancient Israel. And you can't even think or say the name Joshua without thinking or saying the name of his sidekick, Caleb. And his story appears in the book of Joshua. But his story only makes sense when you remember what happened before the children of Israel came into the promised land when they were still in the wilderness, 40 years earlier. When Moses sent 12 spies into Canaan, Caleb was one of them. He and Joshua believed way back then that the land could be taken. But since the other ten spies disagreed, the children of Israel 
all two million of them, ended up in the wilderness. God, however, took note of Caleb's courage. The man's convictions were so striking that God paid Caleb a compliment that would make a saint blush. Here's what God said about Caleb. My servant Caleb has a different spirit and he follows me wholeheartedly. How'd you like to have those words on your resume? God said, I have a different spirit. What type of spirit catches the eye of God? What qualifies as a different spirit? Well, the answers begin to emerge in the distribution of the lands. Joshua chapter 14 and verse 6. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal. The enemy has been neutralized. The time has come to distribute the land among the 12 tribes. Every Hebrew tribe was represented. All the priests, the soldiers, and people gathered near the tabernacle. Eleazar, the priest, had 12 urns, each one containing the name of a specific parcel and or responsibility for each of the 12 tribes. Yet... Before the people could receive their inheritance, a particular promise needed to be fulfilled. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, speaking to Joshua, You know the word which the Lord spoke to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I'm seeing a sturdy man of sinewy muscle, Caleb. Gray-headed and great-hearted, step forward. He has a spring in his step. He has a sparkle in his eye. And he has a promise to collect. Joshua, he says, remember what Moses told you and me at Kadesh Barnea? Kadesh Barnea. That's nearly a 50-year-old memory for Joshua. That was the name of the first encampment after the Egyptian liberation. It was from Kadesh Barnea, from that encampment, that Moses sent out the 12 spies. And it was in this camp that Moses received two distinctly different reports. All 12 men agreed on the value of the land, the land of Canaan. It did flow with milk and honey. All 12 agreed on the description of the people and the difficulty of the challenge. The cities were large and fortified, but only Joshua and Caleb believed that the land could be taken. I want you to read carefully what... Caleb said to Joshua that day at Gilgal, and see if you can determine what was different, why he had a different spirit. I'm going to give you a hint. When you see the words, take note of the capital letters. You ready? Joshua said, Caleb said to Joshua, you know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. As he said these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke his word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am, this day, 85 years old, 
As yet I am strong this day as on that day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now my strength is for war, both for going out and coming in. Now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. Question. What name appears and reappears in Caleb's words? The Lord, 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 the Lord. Nine references to the Lord. So who was on Caleb's mind? The Lord. Who was in Caleb's heart? The Lord. What caused him to have a different spirit? He centered his mind on the Lord. What about you? What emphasis right now would a transcript of your thoughts, what emphasis would a transcript of your thoughts reveal? The Lord or the problem, the problem, the problem, the problem, the problem, the problem, the problem? What's at the center of your mind? What's at the center of your heart? Promised land people do not deny the presence of the problem. Caleb didn't. Joshua didn't. They acknowledge that Canaan is fraught with giants and Jerichos. It does no good to pretend it is not. Promised land people are not naive. They simply Immerse their mind in thoughts of God. They drench their mind in God. Think of it this way. Imagine two bowls of water. No, two bowls. One of them has water. The other has battery acid in it. Imagine... An apple cut in half. Take one half of the apple and put it in the water and leave it for five minutes. Take the other half of the apple and put it in (laughs) battery acid and leave it for five minutes. Which one after a few minutes, are you going to want to eat? (laughs) Your mind is the apple. The basin is the thought that you're giving to your life. Problems are battery acid to your mind. They will corrupt your mind. They will corrode your mind. They will destroy your mind. God will preserve your mind, refresh it, protect it, and nourish it. So where are your thoughts? Caleb stood out Because he placed his thoughts and his mind all around God. And he had a different spirit because of that. The psalmist shows us how to do this. He asked this question in Psalm 42. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? The psalmist, is he's sad, he's discouraged, he's disquieted, he's cast down. The struggles of life threaten to pull him under and take another victim. But at just the right moment, the writer makes this decision. He says, hope in God. 
Hope in God. He moves his thoughts. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. And I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of the Hermon, and from the hill Mizar. Look at the resolve in those words. I shall yet remember you. The writer makes an intentional, deliberate decision to treat his downcast soul with thoughts of God. Everywhere he goes, as he says, I will remember you from Jordan to Hermon to Mizar. In your case, your decision goes like this. Everywhere I go, I will remember you, God, from the ICU to the cemetery to the unemployment line to the courtroom. Everywhere I go, I will lift up my eyes and I will think about you. There is nothing easy about this. It takes every ounce of spiritual resolve and discipline that you can muster. It's easy to focus on problems. It is difficult in the midst of problems to focus on God, but the result is worth the strain. Besides, do you really want to meditate on your misery? Will reciting your problems really turn you into a better person? No. But changing your mindset will. So how do you do this? Caleb shows us. First, you must immerse your mind with God thoughts. Jesus said, stop allowing yourself to be agitated and disturbed. When troubles come your way, you can be stressed, you can be upset, you can focus on the problem, the problem, the problem, the problem, or you can lift your mind and you can look toward God. This is what Caleb did. Caleb could have cursed God. Caleb did nothing to deserve the wilderness. He and Joshua didn't deserve to be sent out for 40 years to wander in the desert. Still, he didn't complain. He didn't grow sour. And when it came time for him to inherit the property, he stepped forward with a God-drenched mind and said, give it to me. I'm ready to take my mountain. The apostle Paul said, set your minds and keep them set on what is above. You see, when giants are in the land and when doubts swarm your mind, turn your thoughts toward God. Your best thoughts are God thoughts. Your best thoughts are God thoughts. He is above all this mess. He is the most high over all the earth. As Moses announced, who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? David said, who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? Isaiah said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You see, God is not just holy or holy, holy. He is holy, holy, holy. He is holy unlike us. And what troubles us does not trouble him. Pain does not plague him. The economy doesn't faze him. The weather doesn't disturb him. Elections don't define him. Diseases do not infect him. Death cannot claim him. And consequently, he has resources we do not have, but we do need. And he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. So rather than focus on your problem, focus on your Father, on God. Let his splendor stun you and inspire you and turn a deaf ear to doubters. Ignore the naysayers. Cover your ears when pessimists crow. People have a right to say whatever they want and you have a right to ignore them. Just because someone sings the blues, you don't have to listen to their music. Caleb didn't. Remember, he and Joshua were outnumbered 10 to 2. But they still believed in God's power. Caleb said, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I, as if to say, I didn't join in, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. 
Caleb deliberately chose to ignore the majority. He deliberately chose to ignore the doubters and turn away. He made a decision to disregard the lethal disbelief of the cynics. There are times you have to do this. This is no sanction to be rude or to isolate yourself. When people express their sincere struggles or questions, help them. But listen to me. Some people don't want to be helped. They really prefer the wilderness. They traffic in misery. They manufacture unhappiness. They have an allergy to joy. And they would rather pull you down than let you pull them up. Don't you let them. Don't you let them. Don't loiter with vultures. They eat death and they vomit on anyone who will let them. Don't you let them puke on you. Sometimes you got to just say, I'm not listening to your negativity any longer. And I realize this is difficult, but sometimes, because sometimes those vultures are in our own house or in our own office. But God will help you with this. You just draw a line in the sand and say, I'm not listening to you anymore. I'm listening to God. Don't you let them pull you under. Caleb didn't. He filled his mind with faith. And he did one more thing. He took on a God-sized challenge. His example inspires us to do the same. Set your mind on a holy cause. You see, when Moses sent Caleb to spy out the land, Caleb saw something that troubled him, and that was the town of Hebron. Hebron, it, it held a special place in the history of the Jews. Hebron was the only piece of land that Abraham ever owned. And Abraham buried his wife there. He was buried there. So was Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob. Joseph had left instructions for his bones to be taken from Egypt, remember, and transported where? To Hebron. So Hebron was a sacred site. But on the day 40 plus years ago when Caleb first saw it, it was inhabited by unholy people, the descendants of Anak. This bugged Caleb to see the burial place of Abraham disregarded and disrespected. It was more than he could take. So Caleb went to Moses and said, can I have Hebron? Caleb didn't ask for Jerusalem perched on Mount Moriah. Caleb didn't ask for the Valley of Eschol where the grapes grew as big as plums. He didn't speak of Jericho or Jordan. He wanted Hebron. He wanted the the land beneath whose oaks Abraham slept whose soil had known the visitation of angels, whose earth entombed this holy family. Caleb, the man with a different spirit, had a different desire, a secret desire. Just give me Hebron, he said. I'm going to take care of it. Moses took the request to God. God gave the answer, and Caleb was given the land. Forty-five years passed. At the age of 85, though, Caleb was ready. He said to Joshua, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke. Last sighting had Caleb turning his face toward Hebron, where he did exactly what he promised to do. He drove out the enemy. He reclaimed the city. He wanted to do something great for God. He wanted to lay claim to God's hilltop. He lived with a higher call. How high is yours? Maybe the reason your problems are so great is because your cause is so small. Maybe the reason that your problems seem so great 
is because your cause is so small. Set your mind on a holy cause. Some years back, I made two trips to Central America within the span of a few months, both trips to the same region, only a short drive one from the other. The cause of the first trip was vacation. The reason for the second trip was an outreach mission. The first trip considered, consisted of, of nice accommodations and good food at a resort hotel. The second involved a budget hotel with very unremarkable cafeteria cooking. On the first trip, I hung out at the pool and I found a golf course and I, I took leisurely walks on the hotel property, property. The second trip consisted of serving food at an orphanage and speaking to church leaders and serving on a prayer revival team. Of the two trips, which do you think proved most enjoyable? You'd think the vacation would. And initially, it was wonderful. But after a couple of days of pampering and relaxing, I began to notice some inadequacies at the facility. The hotel staff didn't clean my bathroom the way I wanted it. They didn't hang my towels the way I like to have them hung. The appetizer was just a little too salty. The room was too chilly, and the bed was too lumpy. I had so many problems. Strangely, on that mission trip, I noticed no problems at all. We worked so hard that any food tasted like a gourmet meal. And since we ministered among the poor, my simple hotel room felt like a presidential suite. We had evening worship services in an open field. It was chilly, it was damp, it was raining, but the thousands of people who attended did not complain. They walked through the mud to get there and stand in the open field, so I didn't complain either. To be honest, the mission trip was more refreshing than the vacation. I like a good vacation, don't get me wrong. But I've also learned this, expect life to be an endless vacation and expect a long list of problems. If your problems are great, then maybe your cause is too small. But when your cause is great, then your problems begin to shrink. I'm wondering, do you have a mission worth giving your life for? Do you have a hill worth taking? Do you have a Hebron that wakes you up in the morning and that commands your best thoughts and your energy? An orphanage to serve? A neighbor who needs your encouragement? A needy family to feed? A class to teach? Some senior citizens to encourage? You know, it really is better to give than receive. And in the kingdom of Christ, we gain by giving, not by taking. And we grow by helping, not by hurting. And we advance by serving, not demanding. You want to see your problems evaporate, then help someone else with theirs. Yeah, we'll always have problems. We'll always face them. But you don't have to face them in the same way. Immerse your mind. In God thoughts. Turn a deaf ear to the doubters. Set your mind on a holy cause. And once you find your mountain, no giant will stop you, no age will disqualify you, and no problems will defeat you. After all, you and Caleb have something in common. You have a different spirit. You, my friend, are a promised land person. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for being so patient with us. We have often, Lord, let our problems define our lives. But even now, Lord, we resolve to let you define us. Thank you for Caleb 
And Lord, our prayer is that there would be something in our lives that would cause you, God, to say, that person has a different spirit. Through Christ we pray. Amen. We're going to step right into a time of communion now. We're going to save our prayer time.